the next generation of a powerful family dynasty that has pulled the strings in Sri Lanka for years is speaking out. Namal Rajapaksa defended his father, the country's former prime minister, and his uncle, the current president, and others in a wide-ranging interview with CNA. The family was hailed as national heroes in 2009 when then-president Mahinda Rajapaksa and brother, then-defense secretary Gotabaya Rajapaksa, put an end to decades of a bloody civil war. The economy boomed on a gush of unsustainable foreign debt. But by 2019, cracks were beginning to show in this model of growth, although it would take a pandemic and war in Ukraine to bring the island to its knees. Sri Lanka has become the first Asian country in more than two decades to default on foreign debt. Soaring inflation and empty coffers mean that the government is unable to buy essentials such as food, medicine and fuel. Widespread protests since early April have called repeatedly for the resignation of the many members of a once revered Rajapaksa family. The president has stayed put, but the prime minister and three other Rajapaksa members who served in cabinet have been forced to resign, including Nama Rajapaksa. The CNA's Lokwe Su spoke to the former sports and youth minister. Mr. Rajapaksa began by stressing the continued demand for further resignations would do little to resolve an economic crisis. People were requesting or demanding uh, for president to resign based on the financial crisis that Sri Lanka is uh, facing at the moment. So the cabinet being dissolved or resigning, then a month later the prime minister resigning, did not or will not address the economic issue of the country because you cannot give a political solution for economic crisis. Unfortunately, Mr. Rajapaksa, for many people in Sri Lanka, the two are intertwined deeply. Now, you're heading into general elections in 2024. How do you do both at the same time? How can you plan for your economy if you're also looking over your shoulder at winning votes in an election in just two years? We need to first address the economic issue before we even talk about the election in two years' time. So we need economic stability. So economic reforms have to take place with utmost priority before we talk about getting into election and winning votes. This is the problem uh, that we have been always facing because every government or every political party is looking at winning votes rather than putting the economy on, on the right track. You know, we have free education, we have free health, and at the same time, there's a massive uh, subsidy program that moving on and happening in Sri Lanka. But at the same time, change your administration structure to grow businesses in our country, you know, help SMEs, you know, get them to the next stage, you know, those kind of economic structures that parties require immediately in our country. So if that happens, I'm sure not myself, not my political party, not Prime Minister's political party, any of us to do politics, we need to have a stable nation and a stable country. And one thing that does take away from stability, many critics, many economists, many analysts have said this, corruption is a very big problem in your country. In fact, yourself, members of your family, many of you have uh, received allegations of financial misconduct. All governments, all uh, public figures are subject to that kind of scrutiny. But your family, your government seems to be unusually saturated with accusations like these. How would you address this image of chronic corruption and nepotism in Sri Lanka? Well, see, I mean, uh, globally, corruption is a great massive problem for any country. And at the same time, the Sri Lanka, the, the previous government had many investigations on us. You know, they were accusing at one point for $18 billion corruption. And they, in fact, went abroad looking for accounts. And they were talking about golden horses, having a massive resort in Dubai. But end of the day, themselves by investigation proved that those allegations are failed. False. And if you look at the last two to three months, you know, they have been accusing me for having digital currency worth of billions of dollars. You know, if that, if that is the story, if that is true, then I should be the richest man in the world. So the accusations can be there. People can accuse you, people can blame you. But at the end of the day, unfortunately, the fake news have been taken the upper hand in our part of the world. But, you know, this is something that we need to address, as you correctly stated. And, and as individual and as a family, you know, we are very much keen and we are very much open for any sort of investigation. It's a question of not what is in fact true, but a case of 
uh, in public parlance, the word optics. So what looks good and what doesn't look so good, as an example. And many people cite this, clearly, because it is a good example. Uh, your uncle, Basil, uh, Mr. Basil Rajapaksa, who was finance minister, was brought back after your other uncle, the president, amended the constitution to allow someone with dual nationality to serve on the cabinet as well. And he had, under the administration of your father, had been charged, he was called, his moniker then was Mr. 10%, in reference to alleged taking of commissions in exchange for government contracts. Now, he was brought back as finance minister at a time of already looming catastrophic economic crisis for Sri Lanka. Now, would your father or your uncle not have thought this is not a good time to be bringing back someone who is known, rightly or wrongly, as Mr. 10%? Well, I mean, see, there have a lot of investigation done on him, and none of them were proven. Uh, he was not proven guilty from any of it. But at the same time, I must say that his appointment was decided by the party, not by my uh, uncles, and I don't want to make further comment on that. As a nation, I mean, if you're looking forward, uh, we need to work on certain criteria for certain positions, and I personally believe in that. And I will serve, I will support that in parliament, and I will look, I'm very vocal about it from the beginning. So, such as portfolios like uh, the finance ministry, justice ministry, and other portfolios that uh, that need professional support. You know, these these kind of portfolios, we need to have a proper guideline uh, given by the constitution uh, when appointing them. And I think that is something that prime we have to look at in our long term uh, administration structure restructuring. All right, a final question, Mr. Raja Park. So you're talking long term, but right now, in the short term, there is still no way out from the protests we're seeing. We're looking at very difficult IMF restructuring months and years ahead and more pain for the people. We've had your Prime Minister warning that inflation could go up to 50% in the next few months. So we need to bring everyone together and work on our development agenda and we help, help the restructuring part of it. So. Only way out, whether it's short term, mid term, or long term, is to get into manufacturing. Promote Sri Lanka much as you can for tourism. And get our foreign remittance coming to Sri Lanka. Because we can talk many slogans that are popular, but none of those will help stability in our country, especially economically. So we need to be active. Only way forward is to have a progressive dialogue talk, come into an understanding and move forward and let the people decide when the time comes to an election. All right. Thanks very much indeed for joining us, Mr. Roger Parkson.